we're talking about one of the things that I think that we think that the church does best, okay? Um, there's a lot of things that I think that we should do well that we don't do well, but one of the things that we think that we do best is fellowship, all right? So in, in uh, uh, college, I went to Oral Roberts University, and I had some friends that, that, uh, that were just really, really concerned about whether or not that we got fellowship time. You know, aside from studies and stuff like that, uh, my friends would always say, hey, we need to ship a little bit, okay? Let's have some ship, you know, that's how that they would say it. Uh, uh, oh, man, that was, that, that, that's good. Um, and so really what that meant was is that we got a play, chance to play video games together. In their minds, they thought that fellowshipping was any time that you can spend away from the books. So I would say we did fellowshipping really well especially my freshman and sophomore year in college. We knew how to fellowship, if that's what fellowship really, really meant. I know that when we say that we do fellowshipping really well, I don't know of any denomination uh, other than the Church of the Nazarene that hangs their hat upon making meals and eating meals together. And if we could, if we could say the definition of fellowship is eating together, we do that really well. I mean, every Sunday night, you know, without, we can't have service unless that somebody cooks something, okay? That's what we do, okay? I actually have heard uh, a few months ago a couple of, of, of people that uh, at a, another event that we were at, and really they, they were two pastors that were talking to one another, and I think that just kind of gives an insight to where our definition lies as far as fellowship is concerned. They went and they greeted everybody, hey, how's it going? How's your church doing yeah that's really great hey have you seen that football game did you did you know that oh you supposed to be really good this year blah 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 and they started talking about football and it was I didn't mean to eavesdrop but I was like from here to that podium and I was like listening to them just kind of staring off into space because I wasn't part of the conversation and and I was just kind of intrigued and then the conversation ended and they said all right well we'll see you see you later and he said hey yeah that's great it was great fellowshipping with you see you later and I got to thinking to myself, is that fellowship? Was that fellowship? I mean, conversations about OU football and then how you're doing. To me, I think that that was just greeting one another and having a small conversation. But if that was real fellowship and what the biblical meaning of fellowship really is, I think that we're in trouble. Uh, because we would say we do that really well. Because I think a majority, I, I, I praise God for the architecture of this particular building because um, I know I've been to certain places before in which it's really difficult to have space after church service is over to go out and have conversations. I love it. I love it how that after our church services out there in the foyer, I mean, it's like... 12.30, 12.45 before we get everybody out the door. And I would, this is not a complaint. I would say, stick around. You know, what you ought to do is that you ought to make a meal at home, bring it with you. We got warmers in the kitchen. Take it, take, take it over. Put that meal in the, in the warmer and stick around. Invite people to eat with you afterwards. Have real fellowship. Not about the meal, but what the true meaning of it might be. There's a passage of scripture in Acts chapter 2 that I have, I've talked about from the very beginning of this series. And uh, if you, it's not going to surprise you, and I might be just uh, bombarding you with this passage of scripture, but it's Acts chapter 2 starting with verse 42. And it says this, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and a prayer. Just note that breaking of bread is in a different category than fellowship in this passage of Scripture. They listed this eating or this breaking of bread or this communion differently than fellowship. It kind of goes hand in hand. It goes along with it. It says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that are being saved. 
think it's interesting, you know, that a Barna group uh, did a study. And the Barna group, I don't know if you know who they are, but they are basically people that do church cultural studies. And they come out with statistics and whatnot. But they said that fellowship was the number two reason why people look for a church. Number two reason. Number two reason why they look for interactions and connections with other people, it's, they called it fellowship, okay? That connection. And a number of years ago, a guy by the name of Chuck Colson wrote a book called The Body. And he says, in the book, he says, a survey showed that the number one thing, actually, the number one thing that people look for in a church is fellowship. Now, I have to propose to you, do you think that in that is that people were looking to see how well that Melba bakes pies, and how good that they taste. I'll tell you what, I'll go to the Baptist church and see who are the best bakers in that church. In the ba whenever they come to it, whoever has the best meals, that's where I'm going to lay roots. No, I don't think at all that that was in the forefront of their mind. Anybody here come to the church of the Nazarene because we have ladies that cook well. So, you know, I love it that Melody uh, volunteers and cooks on, on Wednesdays, and she does the best she can with the budget in which that is afforded to her. Hot dogs, yeah. I mean, come to Wednesday night. We do have hot dogs. You want to know what else we have? Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Yeah, we can fellowship with that. You want to know what else we have? Sometimes we have brisket sandwiches. That's, some, that's good. Barbecue brisket sandwiches. Grilled cheese sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, not only do you eat that, but if you eat your, your entire plate gone, you know what else you get? Maybe a cookie or a cupcake from Melba. Yeah, <laughs> all right? So, but I don't think that, uh, that anybody uh, in their right mind really thought, hey, you know what? Because of Melba's baked goods, because of Melody's cooking, I think I'm going to join that church. And that's not the reason why that they do it, but the reason why that they do it because of hospitality and because it's part of the fellowship. It's part of growing together. It's part of rubbing elbows in the community of believers. But I think that most modern Western Christians, meaning like those that are find themselves in the United States, whatever that they seek is a far cry from what the Bible describes as fellowship. What the early church practice, no term in the Christian lexicon is more abused than the term fellowship. I mean, by intentionality. Let me just kind of tell you something. That I think that true fellowship happens, uh, and I'll give you kind of a working definition here in a little bit, but true fellowship happens is whenever somebody would be able to call you and say, you know what? I'm struggling in this area. And you, they found a safe place with you and they say, could you pray with me? I trust you with this. Or somebody was, would be able to Facebook message you or, or, or text you or come across you in some public arena and, and come to you and embrace you and say, man, I have missed you. I've missed your encouragement. I've, in, I've missed your, your countenance. I've missed just being around you. And there's something about that, not necessarily in just, just your brilliant, effervescent personality that draws you to them, but you know that there's something about you that is not about you. There's something about you that is internal that might be considered in a biblical term a light. A light that is within you and that people, like a moth to a flame, go to the light. Can I just tell you something? Um, and, and I'm just getting ahead of myself, but I think it's appropriate for me to say is that not all personalities get along. Um, even in the church, that I think that there's certain personalities that might rub you the wrong way. I see people kind of looking around saying, oh, no, I know that, that person kind of rubs me the wrong way. But let me tell you something as well. It's part of, part of the fellowship of believers is that if we are to grow in grace, especially about, you know, we talked about in Sunday school, the eye can't say to the ear, how come you're not an eye? You're a little bit different than me, and I think that you're, that ear needs to be seeing a little bit better. Whenever that particular function of that ear is supposed to, to hear and hear alone and not see because it doesn't have an eyeball. 
It's not connected to the brain that way. But the truth of the matter is, is that I think that even in the fellowship of believers, that there needs to be different personalities to help us gain insight because, you know, I can't see out my ear or I can't, because my eyes don't hear, there's a way in which that we gain perspective. I don't know if you guys have, have, have heard this, this Enneagram uh, conversation. Enneagram meaning like that there's nine different personalities and sometimes that you try whenever you find a flaw within your own personality that you kind of elevate to a different personality and not only does that does it try to describe what personality or what box that you need to fit into but it also shows that like nine is is going to have conflict with a number four you know those two really are going to have a hard time being uh, in the same room together and they're probably not going to go on vacations with one another. Um, but the truth of the matter is the reason why that the book was published to gain insight to knowing that the fellowship of believers have differences of minds and, and, and differences of perspective that the body of Christ needs different perspectives. Now, let me just tell you something. There's also generational gaps here. Um, I am right at the cutting mark of millennials. Now, if you are uh, uh, above a millennial, you probably have heard a lot of negativity about us. If you are a boomer, anybody a boomer? Okay, anybody uh, uh, generational X, which is just right uh, uh, above me? What's the generation, the greatest generation? What's that one above the boomers? No? Nobody? Sue, I think you, you might fit in that category. I'm not sure, you know. Uh, anyway, you're the greatest generation, just so you know. But I'm just saying, every generation, although that maybe the, some of us, including myself, get a bad rep, you know, one of the, some of the things in which that, that are said about my generation, we're lazy. <laughs> you ever heard that? Um, um, <laughs> we're lazy, we... Uh, uh, we use technology for everything. Um, and really, the world revolves around us, or, or some of the things. And you want to know what our generation thinks about everybody else? You're closed minded, <laughs> uh, you're, you're outdated. You know, I don't believe that. I just say, I'm just speaking for a generation, you know, that thinks, says those things about you. But here's the thing. I've been alongside people that are older than me that have affirmed my generation and say, you got something to bring to the table. And I've heard actual people that say, look to the, the, the millennium generation and say, you don't know it all like you think you do, but you've got something to bring to the table and we want to hear your ideas. And I think it's time for people like my generation to look to the older generation and say, you've got, you don't know it all but you're learning, come alongside of us and allow us to listen to voices of wisdom. And I think that there's ways at the table that we can fellowship with one another, that there's room at the table for people that have differences of opinion. So let me just tell you what I think. I digress, okay? This sermon just got a lot longer and I apologize for this. It was gonna be really short, but I'm gonna go fast now. You ready? Fellowship, this is what I believe that the Greeks would describe what this word was meant in the New Testament. Fellowship. It means communion. Okay? Communion. Now, this is not just breaking of bread. This is not just partaking in the elements that we call the Lord's Supper. But we're talking about communion. I don't know. Do you commune with other people? Absolutely. And it's not about the partaking. It's about what you're partaking in together. It's about intimacy. It's about longevity. It's about covenant relationship. We're in this together. It's communion. It's intimacy. It's togetherness. It's this participation of people together in God's grace. And I think it's very important that it's in God's grace. Because outside of God's grace, I think it gets very chaotic. There's order to the way in which that we live together whenever we look at how that we live together in grace. Um, I don't know why it's up there twice. So, uh, sorry, I didn't send this to Tiffany Langford before I put it up there. She... <laughs> uh, 
I think really what it meant to is participating of people together in God's grace, having something in common. We'll just say that. Having this particular thing in common. Common participation in something either by giving to another person. Well, I believe that whenever we come to worship God together, you're always in the sense of giving. You're always in the posture of giving. You're giving worship. You're not receiving anything whenever you come to a place like this. We, what we have in common is that we come to give. Now, I know that that has a heavy financial connotation with it. And it sounds like those, one of those preachers is saying, he's just trying to get in my pocket. But that's not really what I'm talking about. Although that's just a, a, a side note, a, 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 a part of what we do. But what we're really here to do is to give attention, to give affection, to give our worship to the one who is worthy. To the one who has given everything to us, we come together to give. And sometimes that means because that we give to God, out of, the, out of the abundance of our giving, that it flows over to somebody else that might be sitting next to us or something, somebody that might not be like-minded or might not be where we are spiritually, but it flows over because of God's grace that he's extended to you and I. It pours out to somebody else and it can be a human being. So, every once in a while, what that might look like, every once in a while when we gather together in fellowship, part of the fellowship is that sometimes the plate is passed for a very specific reason because that we are unity in mind and there's somebody that falls under hard times that we would say, you know what, I believe the community of believers can meet a particular need. So therefore, what we do is that we take a plate and we say, out of my abundance, because of the grace that has been given to me, I give. I don't give because I want something in return. I give because of what God has so richly in, entrusted to me and given to me. And you, some of you might be just sitting here looking, listening to me and say, you know, I don't have what you got. As far as I, I feel like I'm a wanting, needy person. And let me tell you something, if you're a wanting, needy person, you're in the right place. Because I can't just sit here and tell you that my motivation 100% of the time is that I hope to get something back in return. And let me tell you, that's the old casein. And if I can be completely transparent with you, that I think God, God can use that whenever you and I are open and honest about our motivation and our intention. So, we give to God and we give to others. Let me just kind of share a passage of scripture of what unites us together. A few passages, so, so strap in. It's gonna be up here on the screen. You don't have to, but if you're taking notes, take a few of these notes down and I think it's gonna help you in, in just kind of understanding who we are as a body of believers. So Romans chapter 12, verses four through five, it says this. Just as each one of us ha has one body with many members, and the members do not have the same functions, so in Christ, we who are in many form, one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Again, it's that illustration of mouth, nose, ears, although that they are a different part. It's Christ as the head. We're part of something together. We're part of a, a particular function. We're part of a particular purpose. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 14 it says they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus with his brothers they joined together and here's the deal I believe that we have a particular a particular function and a particular purpose together and it's to have the mind of Christ it's to be conformed into the image of Christ whatever that might be um we, we, are, we are constantly on the same direction together. What, whatever your giftings might be, you and I are formed and being transformed into the image of Christ if we connect ourselves to the body. So if you and I hear somebody on the street and they would say, I don't need the church in order to be a believer, I know what they're saying. I understand what they're saying, but it's not biblical. It's not, basically what you need to say, if you had anything to say at all, you could say, if you even felt like the urge to say that, just simply ask him, 
Where does it say that in Scripture? That you don't need the church. It's just like the whole illustration of Benjamin. If his finger was severed, that finger ceases to be alive if it was severed off of his body. And so apart from the body of Christ, we don't fulfill our function. And apart from the body of believers together, we are dead. Can I be so bold? Can I be so bold? We have this fellowship where somebody says that it's like a hot tub religion. <laughs> you know, where it says, well, I come... Because I got some sore, achy muscles and I'm going to dip in to the waters of the hot tub and get relief for every once in a while. And then whenever I leave, I step out of the hot tub and I'm relieved for a little bit. And we're just, just as disconnected coming to a church service as we are as far as the fellowship. And that's why I believe that it's important. This word fellowship is important because there's a connectivity that happens. You can, you can be here physically, but you can be absent from the body. You can, be com you can be here physically, but be completely disconnected in relationship with one another. Acts chapter 4, 35 through 35, 35, 32 through 35 says, All the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed any of his possessions was his own. But they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And much grace was upon them all. Because they, they didn't bring nothing to the table. Whatever that you were seeing them display was all about God's grace. There was nothing special about them other than just God's grace to bestowed upon them. Do you hear this? There was no needy persons among them because out of their abundance that they gave, because of the abundance that God had, had poured out his grace upon them, it wasn't because that there's just like, oh, we have a needy person. No, it's because grace motivated them. There was no needy person among them for they had... From time to time, those who owned lands and houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had needed. Where do you guys ever see that happen? That's not natural, y'all. I'm not going to go sell my entire cattle herd because somebody had... I mean, it's not natural unless that God's grace has, has bestowed it upon me and saying, there's a need. I need to fulfill it. And let me tell you something that I don't think that you need to, to work yourself to a place in which that you become a church that does that or a people that do that. I think you need to depend upon God's grace more than you can the works in which that you do. So let, let God's grace transform you. And let this be a test. And let's just say, Where, where's my works, y'all? Well, I can tell you, I just need to operate in God's grace. And he operate in God's grace. First John chapter 1, verse 3, it says this. It says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son and Jesus Christ. Let me just say, the invitation is there, that if you have fellowship with, with Jesus Christ, what John is ultimately saying in his first book uh, uh, in this little epistle uh, writings that he, he wrote, he's saying, if you've got fellowship with Jesus Christ, find a place to fellowship. And I don't think that it's going to surprise you that whenever I read Scripture, what I see is this relationship with God, this connectivity with God. God and I comes from the outflow of how that you and I behave together and live with one another. So let me just tell you that there are levels of fellowship and I believe that I'm, I'm just going to be gracious with you if you're gracious with me. And I know that there are, there are some of us that wish that you guys have 
that wish that you would go to the highest level in an instantaneous. Like you come to a service and you say, didn't, didn't you just love this? Don't you just love, let's just, let's just set up a tent and let's, uh, let's, let's build a, a condo together and, and let's, let's build it back here behind the church and let's move in together. I don't think, I don't think that that's necessarily realistic, okay? Because um, again, Submission is the only thing that keeps us from killing each other, right? Um, when it comes to the church. Fellowship is the only thing, right? Uh, but I do think that there's a deepening of relationship that even no matter what might be your social ec economic background, whatever might be your race, whatever might be your gender, whatever might be your, your generation, um, your hair color, eye color, you know, whatever that might be, there's still the sense of Whenever the relationship is not two-way, whenever the relationship is not two-way or, or, or continuing to be deepened, there's a sense that's missing. There's a sense in the body of believers that say, I feel like that there, you continue to want to separate yourself. I love this. Anybody ever watch the Toy Story 4? Yeah, I love that movie. Uh, we watched it. I, we didn't watch it. I listened to it on the way to Branson this week. We rented it from Redbox. And there's this character called Forky. And Forky, his entire life, he thinks that he's, meant, he's a plastic uh, spork. Uh, and he thinks that he, his entire life was meant to be used and then thrown away. But this girl finds the plastic fork and she ends up using these twisty ties and makes a face in a, uh, on, on this fork with the, the, the spikes being the hair color and the mouth and everything like that. And all of a sudden, what was meant to be thrown away was meant to be played with, to be, to be used and to be in deep relationship. And so whenever, whenever the, the fork comes, sporky, uh, comes to this realization of who he is, he keeps on wanting to throw himself in the trash. He keeps on wanting to go into the trash. He keeps on wanting to throw himself away. And all the rest of the toys are trying to coerce him to say, you are important. You are important to, what's the girl's name? Bonnie, you are, you're the most important thing to Bonnie right now. She created you. You are not meant to be thrown away. You are meant to be a part of Bonnie's life. You are a part of this intricate part of her life, and you keep on wanting to throw yourself away. And the rest of the toys catch on. They catch on to what, 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 what the heart of Bonnie, the creator, the heart of Bonnie is that she is now part of her life. And they rally together to help, to help remind Sporky that it's no longer trash. You are now part of Bonnie's life and it's important. And I think that's a great picture of what the church should be doing. Amen? The church should be like those toys that recognize someone's value even though that they want to throw themselves away, that they have no value at all. They think that they're just trash. But now, because of your enlightenment, of now that you've come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you are worth something. You're not trash no more. You're part of the fellowship. And we're here to remind you that you have value, you have worth, and you're part of the body of believers. Don't throw yourself away because to sever yourself from the body of believers Believers of fellowship is to mean that you are trash, and God never says that about you one minute. Yeah. You know, every once in a while, God surprises me. Every once in a while, God surprises me, and He just kind of shows up, and He's just like, Here I am. Unexpectedly. And a lot of times that happens whenever we gather together. Most of the time that happens. Whenever we gather together, those aha moments and whenever, you know, you didn't prepare something or, you know, you get this little nudging every once in a while and a light bulb comes on. You want to know what that light bulb is? That's just Jesus coming right up next to you and putting his arm around you and just, that's his presence. That's his presence and it's transforming. It's transforming because everything that I could say about myself, he reminds me of who that I'm not. And he also reminds me of who I am. And I believe that it's important that that happens in this place. And let me tell you something. <laughs> a lot of times that doesn't happen. 
Most of the time that doesn't happen if I'm watching a lot of football, if I'm, I'm watching a lot of, of silly videos on YouTube. And a lot of times that doesn't happen whenever I'm just Facebooking it. You know, every once in a while, some of you will share something inspiring, but it, it, it's not the same as the work of the Holy Spirit when God's presence comes and just puts his arm around you and it's that nudge of, of a reminder of who you are. And I think that it happens in the deepening of relationship and the trust of one another. And I think that it's a two-way. Um, if you come here today and, and you're here this morning and, you, and you're just like, what, what can the church offer me? Well, let me tell you something about relationships that I've, I've come to know. Is that you be, it's, it's called abuse in a relationship. <laughs> It's called abuse in a relationship whenever you are the life sucker. Whenever you, and it's called codependency whenever you depend upon the other person to do all the work. But, and it's really not called relationship. It's really called abuse. In relationship, there's a connectivity, there's a thing called covenant. Togetherness where we say, I'm with you, you're with me. And it's not saying, I do my part, you do your part. It's really just say, really the call to say, could you function, if I'm an I, could you be the ear? If, if, if I'm the nose, could you just be the finger? And could you do your part? I understand that there's going to be hurt along the way. I understand, and, and, and whenever there's grace that is needed, I believe that the body of believers can come together and they can focus in. But here's the deal. If there becomes a, an issue to where that we're just sucking the life, we're abusing our role as part of the body of Christ. So next week, we have some people that are signing up to deepen their relationship with the church. And uh, it was kind of enlightened to me uh, just a couple of weeks ago when I was preparing for Sunday school this morning, one of the, the, the speakers in our video says that the institution of membership in the church is, is not something that is a requirement, but it's just simply a recognition of a relationship that already exists. So this is really what we're saying is, is that I wouldn't ever force membership upon somebody. If somebody has ever gotten baptized in the church, like Eric, Eric did this year, a beautiful moment. I just don't assume that Eric wanted to become a member because of his baptism. No, it's not enforced upon somebody. It's somebody making the statement of saying, I love these people. I want to grow in relationship with one another. And for the body of believers to say, we feel the same about you. We've been growing in relationship with one another and we're just simply making this public statement saying, I'm in it with you. You're in it with me. You keep me accountable. I'll keep you accountable. And we're going on a journey together. And this is the direction we're going, and you're okay with that. And if one of us veers off, if one of us wants to throw ourselves away, we're going in the trash with you, and we're pulling you out. Whether or not that you want to buck at us and fight us the entire time that we want to throw ourselves away to the sins of this world and the ways of this world, if you keep on wanting to throw yourself in there, you don't be surprised that we're coming after you. You don't be surprised that we're going to go in the muck with you, although that I don't want to ever be tarnished by the sin of this world, but I'm going to go into the places, I'm going to go to the dark places because there's a, there's a light in the journey that we're going. Jerry, I, I agree with you. I don't know what I wrote on this sermon today. <laughs> but maybe, there's no doubt about it that somebody needed to hear that today. Somebody needed to remind, be reminded because of the fellowship of believers together that you 
are valuable. Maybe some of you feel disconnected. And I would just say, this is a two-way street. We want you to belong. And I know that it seems like awkwardness because it seems like that some of, them, some of you have been here for 60-some years, and some of you have been here for eight, and some of you have been here for three weeks. And there's people that you don't know, and you still f- feel like we're wrestling with, do I belong or not? And can I just reassure you, you belong. And I want to tell you that you are worth Jesus, God, God says, look at these sparrows. You see how little they are? You see how many they, they are? You're worth more than that. His eye is on those sparrows. You're worth more than that. You're a value. You're a value. Maybe somebody just needed to hear that word of encouragement today. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? And as you bow your heads, can I just uh, remind you that today that some of you are busy. And we live in a culture that are, that, that it becomes a badge of honor in our culture is that if we can say to somebody, hey, how you doing? And if you are able to respond, I'm busy, it's your badge of honor in our culture. And maybe we even use that as an excuse and a crutch sometimes in saying, as far as fellowship is concerned, I'm just busy and therefore I can't. We've got technology now that we think that it makes our life simpler, but we can multitask better now. And to be honest with you, I think it really just makes us more busy. Let me just tell you something that whenever it's of value, that fellowship seems to be of the most important thing. And if we believe that that fellowship happens in relationship, it's two-way I believe it's of value and that you need to invest. It becomes important. It becomes a part of your life. God, help us today. For those that feel disconnected, Lord, let them know that they belong, Lord. And let uh, words of encourage, as, as Scripture says, encourage one another and build each other a fact. Uh, build each other up. In fact, of it, you're doing it right now, God. I pray that we live in that, that we encourage people not to throw themselves away, to be a part of what is going on in the, in the life of being the hands and feet, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. Let's take this journey together in belonging. And it's in Christ's precious holy name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Well, hope that you guys come back at 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, we're going to learn what it means to be the hands and feet in the, in the world of missions. And so we invite you to come back tonight be a part of that. We love and appreciate you. God bless you. You can go in peace.